the first uh, the the first day of the second week of st4 so today the first session is going to be gong show uh, and uh, so the rule for the participants is that like uh, the the order has been like uh, put up in slack who is going after whom and we request like everyone to be just ready with that um, and uh, and what we are going to do is like i will be controlling the slides so like uh, you will tell me like you know next slide and i'll go to the next slide and uh, and uh, and now like uh, after that like uh, i will be giving you like a one minute warning you will have seven minutes in total uh, i'll give you a one minute warning before uh, you know uh, your time ends and once it's done we thought about this gong show uh, this chime like i think there is a conversation going on in chai uh, regarding the like signaling the end of the gong show but like i i don't know like whether we have any provisions for that uh akhil like i mean have i mean do you have anything like you were saying something in the chat Uh, now since you guys have made it seven minutes and plenty of time, let me just open. What? I think he is asking when does he need to make the sound. Ah, uh, seven minutes. No, dude, I didn't. I didn't ask that. I I am not taking it up. I'm no. I'm from my phone, so it's kind of hard. Oh, can somebody else take care of that? Some chime kind of thing. Or otherwise, like what we'll do is like just let them. Yeah, let's I, I, I can, I can set up a timer and uh, arrange something. But uh, chiming, we'll see. We'll see. Okay, it's fine. I'm get, also keeping time. Get to know that time is over, so that there is no doubt about that. Okay, fine. Like I mean, so will you be uh, like uh, like uh, will there be some sound coming from your end or something like that? I suppose so. What do you mean? I suppose so. <laughs> yeah, like what? <laughs> what are we expected? Like, <laughs> yeah, I think it was his voice. I propose. Uh -huh. I propose that at at the at seven minute or six minute mark or whatever you decide, uh, you start saying, "Please God, stop." Okay, well, <laughs> we can have that uh, gift from. This uh, the office, like where Michael Scott goes, like oh God, no, stop, like yeah, I, I, yeah. But I, can we play GIF in between? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Like I think, like we have, I, I, we are, like you know, on record also. So like, let's start. I think like we'll I'll give a six minute warning, like, uh, and after that I'll just ask the speaker to stop. That's the only. We, I think, like, I mean, that's but there will be a chime. Don't worry. Fine. There will be there will great. be a sound. Great, time. great. So, Ankit, uh, I guess you are up. Uh, Ankit, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so you can start now. Okay. Uh huh. Hello, everyone. So. First of all, let me thank the organizer, organizer to give me a chance to, to present my work. So uh, I am presenting uh, my work with my supervisor, the Prasanta Kumar Tripathi. So I am working on the wormhole solutions, this self-supporting wormholes. Uh, next slide. So yeah, these are my outlines. So first we start with the motivation. Then I discuss about the condition for traversability. Then I discuss there are two routes there we can show that the wormholes are traversable. Then I will discuss my work and in the last I will discuss the plot and conclusion. Next. Yeah, so the motivation is that when Suskind proposed that ER is equal to EPR, that when two particles are entangled with each other, that when we define the area CFT correspondence, that particle in the bulk and particle at the boundary, when they are going to be entangled, there must be a 
connection between them and that connection is with this wormhole that when there is some entanglement there is a wormhole that these two particles are connected with a worm but classically that uh, einstein rosen bridge that they are not going to be traversable like social black hole are not going to be traversable if we send the signal from one side it will not go to the second uh, another side so we have to just look whether the wormhole is traversable or not so the wormhole is traversable classically it's not possible to construct a wormhole or to get the wormhole traversable so we use the uh, quantum mechanics quantum mechanically uh, one can show that the wormhole is traversable so the condition for traversability is uh, one can see from the rach other equation if we consider that if our uh, tangent vector field the rays are the orthogonal hyper uh, hypersurface orthogonal then the part omega alpha mu omega alpha mu is equal to 0 from the frobenius theorem we have all those uh, um, terms are negative so uh, if d theta by d tau is negative of something then we can integrate and we can show that all the rays coming from uh, one end can uh, focuses at the throat we are uh, looking all those thing at, at the throat now one can also cast this r alpha mu u alpha u mu in the terms of t alpha mu that is in the terms of uh, in a null energy condition or or the stress energy condition one can write this uh, term in the t alpha beta so if we have after this throat if this throat will uh, violate this null energy condition that is known as the the matter that uh, violate the average null energy is known as uh, exotic matter so if uh, this part is going to be positive after the throat then we can have d theta by d tau is equal to some positive term but uh, we have to make sure that this uh, t alpha mu e alpha u mu is greater than the sum of these two parts 1 by 3 theta square and sigma alpha mu sigma alpha then we have this positive theta is some positive parts so we have the uh, focuses at the throat and then after throat all the rays are going to be defocused so that ensures that the wormhole is going to be a traversable yeah next slide so uh, there are two routes that uh, recently people showed that the first uh, by gauss jeffrey and wall they showed that if we have a two boundaries the conformal boundaries if we add a local interaction then this uh, average null energy condition is going to be violated and our wormhole is going to be traversed one another route uh, last last year marloff and uh, their colleagues showed that yeah one uh, some wormhole is also going to be traversable without adding any non local interactions if we have we consider a metric and we take the g2 quotient and we take another metric m tilde so uh, there is some uh, aspects uh, uh, for this metric m there there are no closed like uh, curves are there closed time like curves are there and uh, the m tilde has the bifurcate killing horizons then we can define the quantum fields on m as well as on m tilde with a uh, condition with a periodic and bound uh, anti periodic boundary conditions that i will discuss uh, in the next slide then we can choose the conditions such that the average null energy condition is going to be violated and then if we show that this average null energy condition is going to be violated then the wormhole is going to be at traversable so we only followed the second path so i am not going to discuss what is the technicalities for this first so i am only discussing the second path yeah so uh, as, as i claim in the beginning that uh, we are going to do these all those things in the quantum mechanically so people already showed that for if the exotic matter that at the throat we have the scalar field or we have the bulk this wormhole are going to be traversable we did this work for the massive vector field for a spin one field so this is the well known action for the massive m field now we have a two vector field this we defined the vector fields amu and amu tilde in the m and our covering space m tilde and the boundary condition amu plus minus x is defined with this plus minus boundary condition so so we have to in the last we choose this plus and minus sign such that our anc is going to be violated now we can uh, find the stress energy tensor now we are going to find our stress energy tensor along the null rays when we take the kmu k new term then the, the term in the parenthesis is equal to 0 we have to only take care of the first two terms now we have the is f alpha mu is like d alpha d mu and f beta mu d beta a new so this all those things we can derive if we have a two point function then we can uh, differentiate this two point function and we can find what is our t mu new is so we will just uh, put this um, f alpha minute. beta we first find the what is the okay so next slide yeah. 
next yeah so we can find this uh, two point function from this two point function we just differentiate twice this and we get the contribution of f alpha beta f beta mu and just take the and this two point function also is the contribution from a alpha and a beta using this all those uh, calculation we get this is our t mu the energy condition and we this is just if we choose the periodic condition that a mu plus a mu x and x if we choose the negative then we have extra negative sign that we have showed in our paper and we just plot this function the next slide so yeah here is the plot of the first figure is the plot of tu versus u if you take the entry periodic then this uh, graph is in the uh, third and fourth quadrant and it ensures that our wormhole is going to be traversable these two figures shows that if uh, whether our uh, condition energy is a convergent or not so if we take the large n this is going your, to be convergent this up. tn this graph is shows that yeah okay gone, gone. thank you that is that was really bad rohit <laughs> you said there will be a sound not you literally going gong gong like <laughs> uh, i tried something but it didn't work out <laughs> Uh, Buddha Ditya, you can start yeah, so now. Can I start? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, thank you for, ha for ha having me here. I'm going to talk about a general prescription for semi-classical semi holography that is available in this uh, paper uh, archive number here. So in this we in this work we focused on the general properties of uh, the holographic construction, and from that we proposed a, a general way to to work through holography in an, an arbitrary space. Time. So next slide, please. So yeah, so I'll give you a small overview of it. So the object of interest that we have here are the bulk solutions, which are which are created from sources that we localize on a suitably chosen ho uh, holographic screen. The preliminary object of interests are the semi-classical correlators on this holographic screen that we calculate. Of course, we wish for better uh, better observables like like uh, S matrix elements and so on and so forth. But as of now, that is the uh, observable we have been uh, we have managed to produce. So this approach that I'm going to describe in the next few, few slides reduces to the standard ADS Dirichlet approach with a uh, with an appropriate choice of uh, hol holographic screen and boundary. All of this is in the Euclidean case. In the uh, Lorentzian geometry, we see an uh, interesting phenomena of the emergence of a homogeneous mode. Which we can treat as a natural analog, what the, uh, from uh, analog of the ADS normalizable mode. This mode also allows us to perform bulk re reconstruction following the HKLL procedure. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So as you can see, this is the geometry of the uh, spacetime. The the metric that we have chosen here uh, is this one, where gamma AB is a is some arbitrary function. Now, this is not the most general uh, metric that one can choose. If you'll know, uh, notice here that there's a property of this metric is that the holographic coordinate, so the so-called holographic coordinate, that is the R here, is normal to the boundary. Now, this does not mean that our that our boundary is uh, has spherical symmetry or anything like that, but this is still a very slight restrictive condition on the metric. The blue region is the bulk where we solve for, a, for, for the phi, which is the wave, uh, which is the solution of the wave, wave equation. The J naught that you see here is the source and the gamma AB capital R comma X is the uh, metric on the, on the boundary. So this is the setup where we are going to work. Uh, next slide, please. So the prescription goes as follows. We first solve for the wave equation in the bulk with a source fixed on the, on the, on the holographic screen. In the Euclidean case, as in, as in all other cases, we'll, you'll have two solutions since it's a second order order differential equation. But in the Euclidean case, we impose the condition of regularity and the regularity condition uh, does away with one, with one of the solutions, which, is, which, which turns out to be divergent in the bulk for the metric that we have chosen above. The other solution that remains is the one that is created by the, by the Green's function as given in this big expression here. Now, uh, the next point is to, is to choose the Green's function properly because the Green's function has to be chosen by specifying the boundary conditions. The particular choice we make is, is that we allow the Green's function to have finite values on the holographic screen, but vanish at infinity. Uh, if you'll note, this is uh, contrary to the usual ADS pres prescription where the Green's function vanishes at the boundary. 
In our case, since our since our holographic screen is something that we have chosen arbitrarily, we wish our greens function to be independent of the choice of the screen. Hence, this this uh, particular boundary behavior of the greens function. It also allows us to analytically continue to the Feynman propagator in the in the Lorentzian case. Now, once we have the solution, we can move on to calculating the action and and so the correlator. So there are two ways to do that. Either we can integrate the action in the bulk in the blue region in the previous uh, slide, or we can integrate it over the entire space time. Next slide, please. So uh, here I motivate this. So uh, the reason why we choose to integrate over the entire space time to find the action is threefold. Firstly, that we have taken our Green's function to vanish at infinity. So it's the natural choice to uh, integrate over the over the entire region where the Green's function has non-zero values. Secondly, we wish to define a hologram of the entire space time and not just the uh, region enclosed by the by the holographic screen. And thirdly, uh, one can see that the differential and extrapolate dictionaries match in this particular uh, by calculating action in, the, in this particular format. So once you do this calculation, you find that the uh, bulk action turns out to be this second expression that you see in the, the uh, first equation that you see here is that <clears throat> is that the, the integral turns out to have only two contributing terms one from from uh, from very near to the holographic screen but inside it sorry uh, and one from uh, outside the holographic screen uh, but near to it so this leads us to the action as bulk and hence the correlator next slide please uh, so we can show by appropriate source uh, choice of source and uh, and the holographic screen that this reduces to the ADS safety correspondence we also work with the with the Lorentzian case where we have a homogeneous mode. Once we choose the homogeneous mode and set the other parts to zero, we can we can also perform bulk re reconstruction via the HKLL procedure. The kernel that we use here can be obtained from the Lorentzian Green's function uh, via the Green, Green, Green's theorem. In that paper, we have done explicit calculations as well. So yeah, and uh, we can add interactions to this. Up till now, we have been doing free theory. We can add interactions to it via a Witten diagram prescription. So yeah, that's all. Thank you. Uh, so you still have, we have uh, time for questions. One minute, maybe. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. If anybody would like to ask questions, just go on mute yourself. Hi, so uh, since you are, uh, if I understood it right, you are integrating the whole thing even outside the surface. Okay, yes. The screen. Yes. So would, would you also say that you won't need to add any counter? I knew I won't need to add any. Did you also have to add? I think what sense counter what terms. Sense are... Oh, no, 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 no. There is uh, since since we are uh, integrating over the entire uh, space time, we we uh, haven't, I mean, uh, faced the need to add a counter term to this. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, we can go to the next speaker. Uh, Adrita, you can unmute yourself and please. Yes, hello, hello everyone. So good morning all. Today I will present my work on strings in AVJ model from the perspective of Norman Rasukatia's integrable system. This is uh, the work done by my supervisor and me and has been published in Journal of High Energy Physics in 2019. Next slide, please. So firstly, I will briefly discuss about the significance of integrability in both sides of ADS safety correspondence. This has been first observed by Mirahan and Sarimbu in their 2003 paper, where they have shown the matching of anomalous dimension of one loop dilatation operator in a SU2 sector of N equal for SYM with the eigenvalues of Hamiltonian being operated on an integrable SO6 pin chain model. So this in turn gives us the energy spectrum of free string states in terms of tooth coupling lambda in planar limit in the ADS side. Thereby, it makes the n equal for SYM calculable much in, in a much easier way in the planar limit than the holographic approach, and thereby helps to overcome the problem with the strong coupling calculations. Next slide, please. So this is the celebrated ADS CFT correspondence uh, conjectured by Ivan Maldosan in 1998, and ABJ theory is a very promising candidate for ADS4 CFT3 correspondence. 
it is a kind of generalization of the aharoni bargeman jefferies theory uh, maldasena theory that is abjm theory um, where uh, the abjm theory is a duality between n equal for super conformal transformal theory with this gauge group and the uh, type 2a super string theory on ads4 times cp3 with pure nsns to form class so here the modification in abj theory has been done like the gauge groups have two different ranks that is same not equal n but the amount of maximal supersymmetry remains fixed so this kind of theory has two types of possible gravity dual backgrounds m theory on ads4 times s7 by zk for this limit and this is the other type 2a super string theory on ads4 times cp3 with bns solenomy turn to bottom cp1 here this particular range of n ensures the presence of planar limit and hence the, uh, this is more appropriate for calculations in planar limit so we will be considering this particular background in our remaining work so next slide please so this is the metric for the desired background that we have taken here for our calculations and this is the uh, particular bns holonomy through cp1 with uh, the associated flux components so here we will be considering the bosonic string part only thereby we are uh, considering only polyakov action along with uh, the antisymmetric wesomino interaction term incorporating the two form nsns flux in the background so for uh, analyze uh, for the analysis of rotating string and passing string we have considered these embeddings respectively and this is the general answer so what uh, what is uh, taken into account for the construction of inner model here m is at the integer of integer winding numbers of the string uh, strings moving in this uh, background uh, this m is incorporated in the passing string embeddings the next slide please so uh, the one dimensional neumann rossbacher system is an integrable system representing the motion of a harmonic oscillator constrained to move on in minus one dimensional unit sphere in n dimensional space in the presence of some extra centrifugal coulomb potential with this form so this this is the lagrangian and this is the hamiltonian for the undeformed integrable neumann rossbacher system here this term incorporates the geometry of the uh, sphere via some suitable lagrange multiplier so by incorporating the embeddings in our uh, polyakov action and uh, calculating the target space lagrangian we got the stresses from ro ro rotating and passing strings where it is quite obvious that uh, these two uh, quite resemble this uh, undeformed lagrangian with uh, both the harmonic oscillator and centrifugal type potentials along with some integrable deformation which is coming due to the presence of the flux in the background so we can uh, say that we have successfully constructed the normal rossbacher's model in our desired background even with the presence of flux which incorporates some deformation in it so next slide next slide the allenberg integrals of motion are some conserved quantities for inner model having this general form and satisfying this relation so here the integrals of motion that we have obtained for rotating and passing strings are like this where this term and this term has come due to the presence of the uh, flux in the background but along with the uh, presence of these terms so these two uh, satisfy this relation and also resemble this general form so this type of construction of allenberg integrals of motion predictably supports our formation of um, inner model in this uh, desired abj dual background with the presence of flux so next slide please so after solving the integrable model we got the dispersion relation for finite size correction for strings rotating with two independent angular momenta like this where this uh, term uh, consists of the flux term having the flux strength to be unity and here the uh, this dispersion relation resembles the uh, dispersion relation for ionic giant magnet in this particular subspace and the same for the passing strings with two independent angular momenta is this where it is conventionally represented as the power series expansion of a uh, large oscillation quantum number that is it is a particular relation of energy with the power series expansion of the large oscillation quantum number and for small energy limit this presents the extent expansion of uh, first strings were sitting in one plane after the first order that is um, you have one minute oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, energy is proportional to square root of m so next slide please 
Thus, concluding remarks, we can tell that the construction of one dimensional integrable inner system in this residual background with the BNS holonomy on CP1 can be a very nice platform to uh, deal with the uh, very well known uh, general string and such by solving this integrable model along with the derivation of very uh, previously known scaling relations among various charges. And this can be extended for other string or brain like solutions also in this background and to check the integrability of it via in our system. And also, it will be interesting to compare the energy momentum scaling relations for such natural force in this background with the solutions of asymptotic Betti and such equation by using Nash correction formulation. This will be giving some intriguing ideas about the integrable scaling description of this background. Okay, thanks, Sadhita. Um, we can move on. So, like, since we have a few speakers, like, there will be plenty of time for question and answers, maybe at the end of the session. Uh, so, Pavan, you are up. Uh, your times. Pavan, are you? Hi. Are you? Yeah. Okay. So, uh -huh. your time starts now. Hello, I'm Pavan Dharani Prakada. I'm from IMSC. This work is uh, together with my uh, guide, uh, Balachandra and Satya Palan. Uh, so, it's, so, we're going to discuss uh, how to make a finite EM tensor for a phi cube theory. Next slide, please. So, uh, usually you define your uh, canonical energy momentum tensor this way. Uh, uh, and uh, so, you require it to uh, obey the conservation equation. And for phi, phi cube theory, it takes this form uh, particularly. And uh, the problem is that this is not finite. And you'd like your energy momentum tensor to be finite because uh, uh, in weak external gravitational field, uh, knowledge of uh, the T mu nu uh, matrix elements is important for uh, uh, having it uh, to describe scat scattering. So. Uh, but also that uh, this T mu nu is not unique. Like you could add uh, terms with this uh, uh, particular uh, structure and it won't affect the conservation or uh, the point carry generators, but it might affect the dilatation and conformal generators. The next slide, please. So the, uh, to make it uh, uh, to finite, to make it finite, you need to uh, uh, because T mu nu is a composite operators, you need to be able to uh, renormalize the composite operators in the theory. Uh, and the theory, uh, phi cube theory looks like this, and we'll be looking at it in six dimensions. Uh, and uh, firstly, uh, to make the composite operators finite, we look at the relation between parameters, uh, uh, del f by del j, uh, I mean, for f, f, which is any general function of the parameters, you find relation between the uh, unrenormalized and renormalized parameters. The renormalized ones are uh, without the subscripts, and unrenormalized ones have this zero subscript. So, next slide, please. So, you, you uh, have these uh, uh, various operators in the theory in uh, this uh, column vector kind of uh, notation, and so uh, each of these. Uh, uh, terms in the uh, column vector uh, mix with the uh, rest of the operators uh, below them, not above them. So uh, you'll have phi, phi naught cube will be a, a, a linear combination of uh, every other operator you can see here and so on. And uh, the matrix which gives their relation is given by Z. So as you can uh, see, this Q naught uh, is uh, all divergent uh, operators and the Q in between this uh, square brackets is uh, all finite. And the E naught you see here is the uh, in, uh, is the equation of motion operator. Uh, so you just, uh, so the equation of mo motion operator has a special property that it is finite. It doesn't uh, renormalize. So, uh, so it's beneficial to use that instead of uh, uh, one of the other operators, del phi, del phi. So, so these are all the linearly independent operators you have in the theory. Uh, and next slide, please. So, uh, so we require the uh, Green's function uh, to be finite, and 
we used the differential uh, so differentiation relations we had before on the Green's function and require the finiteness of the coefficients and that is how you get a matrix uh, uh, that uh, this matrix that relates the unrenormalized and renormalized co composite operators uh, as you can see uh, so the uh, some of the terms so the terms a1 a2 a3 a5 these relate the uh, uh, phi naught cube with uh, uh, the rest of the operators but uh, which are which don't have a total derivative on them. If, can you go back one slide, please? So a4, a6, a7 correspond to del square phi, del 4 phi, and del square phi square. These are uh, total derivative operators, and thus uh, differentiating the Green's function with the parameter doesn't give uh, any information about them because uh, when you differentiate uh, Green's function with the parameter, you usually get an integral, and that. So you can't get any relation for the total derivative of it. Next one. Right, so so to get some kind of relation for the rest of them, A4, A6, A7, and C, you have, a, a, you define the anomalous dimension matrix, uh, like in the last uh, sentence. So next slide, please. And and uh, you, you have, a, so all the elements in this are finite, so Instead of dealing with the divergent quantities A4, A6, A7, you deal with this zeta 4, zeta 6, zeta 7. Next one. So now that uh, we have the uh, we have finite uh, scalar operators, uh, we can define the same uh, use these uh, scalar operators to define finite uh, tensor operators as well. Uh, so we we use the uh, so we deal with this T mu nu operators which have this differential operator T mu nu. Uh, this is beneficial because uh, this is traceless and it doesn't mix with uh, any scalar operator multiplied by G mu nu. So uh, you have uh, this fixed, uh, so finite T mu nu, finite will only mix with these finite operators. And uh, you can get these relations uh, just by expanding uh, all these terms and uh, you have uh, A2, A3, A4. So a1 as v1 and a2 a3 a4 you yeah, get in terms of, right in terms of uh, existing divergent quantities a7 a4 a6 next slide please so so once you determine all the uh, traceless uh, operators uh, in terms of finite operators you can write team you expand it and you can separate out the divergent quantities which all come out to be uh, in the terms after TC mu nu. So TC mu nu is the canonical EM tensor and T mu nu is the one improved one we are defining now. Uh, and uh, so you, you can express all these in terms of manifestly finite quantities and the, the expression, second expression is the final one. Next one, please. So you can look at the uh, divergence uh, of this one and it gives the equation of motion operator and uh, this goes to zero uh, on uh, on shell and the trace uh, also you see that it doesn't disappear and one more thing is because we used uh, quantities which are not renormalization in invariant we have yeah this is not renormalization invariant yeah yeah, yeah. So RT menu is not renormalization invariant, but uh, you can see that at fixed point, uh, this uh, derivative of T menu goes to zero. Yeah. Thank you. Shailesh, uh, uh, you're up next. Okay, okay. Am I audible? Yes, your time starts now. Okay, okay, thank you. So I'm Shalesh Kumar, uh, currently enrolled at Triple IT Allahabad uh, and uh, working as a PhD student in third year. And uh, for this uh, ST4, I would like to thank the organizing committee for give, giving me this wonderful chance to present my work. And I will be talking about the displacement memory and BMS symmetries. And the uh, references uh, for the work is based on this uh, recent communication with the journal uh, uh, High Energy Physics. So next slide, next slide, please. Uh, so gravitational memory effect is a non-oscillatory part to the gravitational wave amplitude, which basically generates a permanent displacement 
for freely falling test particles or test detectors, uh, which is being induced by gravitational waves. And in the figure, if you look at, so if you have ring of test masses, and we say that when the gravitational wave is not carrying memory, we don't find there is a relative change in the orientation of ring of test masses. And in the second case, if the gravitational wave is carrying memory, we say that the, the there will be a permanent change in the orientation of ring of test masses. So this is what we call the gravitational memory effect. And from theoretical point of view, uh, recently it has been shown that the memory effect is related to the asymptotic symmetries of space times, which were originally discovered by Pondy, Vandenberg, Merzner, and Sachs in early 60s. Next slide, please. So as a recent progress, uh, it has been shown by Hawking, Perry, Strominger. Uh, they conjectured that the BMS charges would help to retrieve the information in information loss puzzle. So uh, recovering BMS symmetries near the horizon has become an active area of research. And uh, from observational point of view, people are expecting to detect the memory uh, signal in the, uh, I mean, advanced LIGO detectors and laser detectors. Uh, there have been several, several works by Nicholas P.D. at all. And uh, for this purpose of talk, I would be discussing a model scenario where uh, gravitational waves will be interacting with the test detectors and produce some measurable effects. Next slide, please. So memory effect for near horizon asymptotic space times, next. So uh, as we know that for far reason case, when the uh, detectors are being placed at the asymptotic null infinity I plus, and they would interact with the gravitational wave and they will uh, produce a, a, a permanent change in the uh, relative uh, uh, displacement vector. And uh, this uh, shift in the deviation vector can be rep reproduced via a super translation, which relates the uh, displacement memory effect with the super translation uh, for the far reason case. And our goal is to uh, uh, study and uh, analyze uh, uh, results uh, to show that the displacement memory near the horizon of the black hole is actually related to the BMS symmetries. So for this purpose, basically, we have shown these uh, findings and uh, the geodesic deviation equation uh, will basically capture the relative displacement between the two test, detect test detectors, which are being placed near the horizon of the black holes uh, depicted in the figure as H+. Next slide, please. So as a result for four dimensional case, near horizon asymptotic form of the metric, we have uh, uh, this form of the metric, which is given uh, in the Donny et al paper and uh, other uh, properties of the metric also given in, the, in that paper. And uh, with the following, uh, uh, I mean, metric fall of conditions, the metric remains preserved. And uh, also we have the uh, transformations of the metric parameters along the killing direction, this cup and lambda IP is along the king direction. There will be other transmissions along the king uh, direction for other parameters, but relevant ones I have mentioned here. So here for different cases of uh, kappa, we can have a transformation of the function f, uh, uh, which is, uh, we, uh, I have written as constant kappa and uh, kappa zero cases. And next please. So as a result, uh, we find uh, that, uh, next slide please, yeah. So we find that uh, we have uh, two super translations, T and X, and together with one super rotation Y. So, and this is in contrast to the uh, far reason case where we had only one uh, super translation. And as a result, we find that there's uh, the solution of the geodesic deviation equation, the S zeta bar component has this form. And written in terms of change in the metric parameters, delta lambda IB, and these uh, metric parameters are related to the other metric uh, parameter, other uh, components of the metric parameters, basically. And uh, this relation between the metric parameters can be uh, seen via uh, using the uh, using the Einstein field equation, considering the uh, shock wave profile of the stress tensor. And uh, since the memory is this uh, displacement, displacement delta S, zeta bar is independent of V uh, coordinate, V parameter. Here we have delta V square that is changed and it is constant. It does not explicitly depend on V parameter, right? So our variation along the lambda direction should also be independent of uh, uh, V uh, uh, pa parameter. And this ensures that if we freeze the super transition parameter, we does get a super rotation, which will basically induce the same, yes. same shift in the uh, displacement vector. And uh, this is nothing but basically uh, establishing a connection between displacement memory and uh, uh, BMS symmetries. Next slide, please. So here, as a special case, we have uh, another form of the metric where we consider uh, that the metric is especially deformed in the spatial sector with a GVA component to be zero. 
And here we consider that this copper tinting to zero case produces the displacement memory uh, to the, uh, I mean, proportional to row order uh, and higher order can also be computed, of course. And this particular case basically mimics uh, the memory which is being obtained at the far region. So it is a similarity, one sort of similarity we have. And uh, then again, uh, we see that this displacement memory component is independent of B parameter. And if we uh, basically uh, uh, take the in, uh, variation of the lambda IB component in, independent of B parameter, then it ensures that if we switch off the super rotation parameter, we get a uh, super translation solution. And yes, thank you. So we get super translation solution and uh, ultimately uh, this uh, uh, super translation solution will ensure that we can get the same shift in the uh, geodesic deviation solution. And this basically uh, establishes a connection uh, between memory effect and uh, uh, BMS symmetries for this uh, less generic form of the metric. So next slide, please. So thank you. I would be happy to take questions if, you, if time permits. Yes, we have time for one, one or two questions. Yes, sure. I, I, I have a question. Is there an understanding why GVA equals to zero actually reproduces the, the BMS memory effect? I mean, uh, as the one. Yeah, I mean, uh, theoretically, basically, we considered, uh, I mean, this is just a model scenario, you know. So here we just try to take a, because if we take the full metric, the result is not, I mean, it is in compact form, but uh, it is not, uh, I mean, very compact form. So we just try to look at the form if GVA component to be zero, which means physically that the metric is only deformed in the spatial sector, because uh, usually we have the spherical symmetry, right? So we just try to take the spherically, spherically deformed uh, metric where GVA component to be zero and try to see the analysis. And it turns out that in the far horizon case, so the memory is proportional to one by R and in the near horizon case, it is proportional to row, that is a horizon, right? So it is basically mimicking the memory effect, which is being obtained at the far region. So this is one sort of similarity uh, we could get uh, by considering this assumption. So that was our purpose, basically. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suman, like you're- Hello, okay. am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, your time starts now. Okay, hi everyone. I have done this work in collaboration with Diksha Chandurkar, Subham Dattu Jodhari and Professor Siraj Minwala and thanks to the organizer for giving this opportunity. Next slide, please. So let's start. It's a very interesting problem to classify all possible consistent graviton S matrices. We already know many, many examples of consistent S matrices in string theory due to various possible compactive equations. But these uh, various possibilities of compactive equations makes the classification program very difficult to pursue. But if we consider G string goes to zero limit, then we see that all known different string theory answers reduces to only three possibilities. These are Einstein gravity, type two theory, and heterotic string theory. This gives a very good place to start the classification. And one can ask how many consistent classical S matrix are there except these three. Choudhury and collaborators in 2019 has conjectured that there are none except these three known examples. But classical, by classical, we mean the amplitude will have only pole type singularities. This is still a very ambitious statement to prove because we have to consider infinite number of spin exchanges and we can further restrict and say that the only consistent classical gravitational S matrix whose exchange poles are bounded in spin is the Einstein S matrix. Next slide, please. In D less than equal to six, this conjecture is indeed true, provided the S matrix will have only finite number of poles and it satisfies a physically motivated constraint on S matrix in regi limit. This constraint is named as classical regi growth conjecture or CRG conjecture. I'll briefly mention the statement. It says the S matrix of a consistent classical theory never grows faster than S square at fixed T. But is CRG conjecture true? We have given a clear argument for CRG conjecture using the bound on chaos and ADS safety for contact interactions of spinning particles. Next slide, please. In this work, we have considered a four point function of massless spinning particles in ADS. In this picture, you can see four insertion points P1, P3 below at time tau and P2 and P4 above at an angle theta. These are the only parameters in the problem. 
as we change tau from pi to zero, it explores total three different causal configurations. Next slide, please. When tau starts from pi, it is in the Euclidean configuration. Once tau crosses pi minus theta, it enters causally Rege configuration where chaos bound applies. It says the normalized boundary correlator cannot grow faster than one by theta square in small theta limit. Finally, when tau is less than theta, it enters the causally scattering seat where actual scattering can take place in the bulk. And we get a bulk point singularity in the, in the calculus. Here we have identified the coefficient of bulk point singularity to the flat space S matrix. You can see an expression. This is a typical kind of equation for various spinning cases. It was done for scalars before. We have extended it for photons and gravitons. The row divergence shown in red is the bulk point singularity. In Rege limit, sigma is taken to zero and determines the Rege behavior of the correlator. A still law of omega shown in blue is the flat space S matrix in Rege limit of the same interaction. Next slide, please. Thank you. In sigma goes to zero limit, the same correlator takes this form, shown in the box. It says in the leading term, sigma scaling is totally decoupled from the function of rho. And the rho, sigma behavior doesn't change with the causal structure, which effectively determines the Rege scaling of the correlator. Now, all we do is prove that the function h of rho is an analytic function of rho, extended over two configurations. The analytic contour is shown in the figure, the above and the below part of the contour is in Rege seat and scattering seat respectively. Now we got something nice. Two configurations are related by an analytic continuation in row variable. This implies the function of row cannot suddenly become entirely zero in the scattering seat if it is not zero in the Rege seat. This relates chaos bound in Rege seat to the CRG bound on flat space S matrix in scattering seat. So to summarize what we have achieved, well, first, we have derived a relationship between leading row singularity in ADS correlator and flat space S matrix for spin, spin one and spin two. And second, we have proved that if chaos bound is true in Rege, Rege, chaos bound is true, then CRG bound is also true in the uh, for the contact interactions in spinning particles. Next slide, please. We certainly have some limitations in our calculation. Since we did this calculation only for contact interaction, it is important to prove the CRG bound also for exchange diagrams. We have taken flat space limit of ADS and used ADS CFT to show the CRG conjecture in the bulk. It would be very satisfying to get the direct bulk argument for CRG conjecture without using any ADS CFT. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? We have. Uh... Plenty of time for questions now, and also uh, can uh, can I ask? You, so Shumon is the last speaker, right? So, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, you, now I, I think, think we start. can open up the floor for a, a yeah. questions to any speaker. Yeah, Shumon, can you please go to that slide where you're defining this uh, rage shit and scattering shit or something like that? Yes, that's in. Unfortunately, uh, can you go back one? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so this. It's okay. And then in, in the next slide, I guess. I think next slide, yeah. 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 So, what do you, I mean, what do you mean by something like causally rege? And I mean, what is the difference between causally rege and causally scattering? I mean, don't you just ah, say so that? Can, can you go to the last slide? Uh, sorry. Not this slide, but uh, uh, I mean, extreme last. Go after that. Yeah. So, so this is the so the same configuration you saw in that picture, right? I, I have not drawn all these things, but mm -hmm. this you can see this P1, P3, and P2, P4 uh, like insertions, right? Mm -hmm. So what we are saying that you can see that P1 and P3 are at t is equal to tau, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it is at t is equal to pi the other two. Now you start from the right side, right picture, okay? Now we are starting so, so from is equal to pi. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, you are uh, so you are scattering. Uh, so it's like okay. So so physically or whatever. So is the incoming ones are like p one, p three, and the outgoing are p two, p four. Exactly, like exactly. And and you will see say that it is in scattering seat when p two and p four both are in the future of p one and p three because if it if it doesn't happen, then the scattering is not there. Right? Yes, yes, so to yes. So yes. get a scattering in the bulk, you have to have all the future particles in the in the light cone of the past particles. Yes. So yes. that's that's the scattering set. But Rege seed is uh, uh, is the usual Rege configuration where P 
P four is in the causal configuration of P three, and P two is in the causal configuration of P one, and 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 others are spatially separate. So that's the usual Rayleigh configuration. I see. I see. And 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 the so the branch for the the branch cut structure that you showed in yes. the um, uh, so it's it's in some e to the power two rho plane, right? So so True. what was that plane physically or something like that? Uh, at least in terms of. Physically, what that? No, no, not okay. physically. Forget about physically. So I just, I just want to. So, for example, in terms. So, can you? So, is that um, plane? I mean, the structure uh, is under. So, uh, I'm physically in the sense. I'm just telling that in terms of Mandelstam variables. Can you tell like in what? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So this instead of rho, we took e to the power two rho. Uh, mm. You can you can think it as I mean a yeah, very like familiarly as a z by z bar plane. Okay. So you know this z and z bar uh, like uh, this cross ratio, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So so if you take the ratio of them, you will this e to the power two rho is exactly equal to that z by z bar. The ratio of these two cross ratio. So you yes. are looking at that plane uh, in the complex like z by z bar is one complex variable, and then you are looking at that variable. So that's the e to the power two rho. I see. I see. Yeah. But that can be related to like usual uh, in some limit to the. Uh, So Mandelstam variables of like of the scattering amplitude, right? Look, Mandelstam variables and cross ratios, I think, are related by a very complicated transform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. I don't I mean, know. I mean, I mean, I mean uh, they're directly relating it. I don't know whether there are algebraic relations. But yeah, I can I mean, tell you that the bulk point is achieved when e to the power two rho goes to one. So when rho goes to zero, you achieve yeah. that. Uh, you know this. This tau, if you make this tau to zero, mm. then you access the bulk point limit, right? So mm. tau goes to zero is the bulk point limit when mm. the scattering can take place. So that's that's roughly uh, the the physical in, intuition. And and another question is, uh, so you 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 told about obviously you did it in the uh, three level, like okay, so the four. Yes, yes, right? totally. So what do you think? I mean, in your analysis, I mean, uh, so what do you think when you are, so for example, when you allow. Uh, uh when you allow loop so essentially i can okay from mathematical point of view i can see that okay if you allow loops you are going to uh, necessarily have to allow branch points or something like that so do you so that, will that uh, change i mean uh, maybe can you comment truly on speaking, like how that will yeah yeah happen? yeah truly speaking i don't have any idea about what will happen in the quantum case but there are some studies on non perturbative uh, quantum cases Uh, by you know this uh, this sub boundaries papers are there, mm -hmm. and uh, the in recent ADS paper talks about that uh, quantum bounds, mm -hmm. but uh, but I have not understood those things very clearly. Oh. Okay, thanks. Even we don't we don't understand what happens for exchange diagram, for example. Even in Padavasan, like this is not clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. I think it ends here. uh like others please like i mean since we have plenty of time uh we can uh have question and answers uh if you guys are up for it like uh i have a question for suman this this might be a bit naive but like uh, akhil you are You your volume is very low. We can't barely. Uh, what about what about now? Am I am I audible now? I I think I can hear you, but oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Any any so, yeah. What I understood is like you guys relate the uh, this Vega growth bound. Yes. To, you guys want to the to to the chaos bound in ADS. Yes. Right? But then in also the chaos bound can be violated if you switch on background fields. Right, background electromagnetic field or something, or in other words, if you turn on uh, some chemical potential or whatever, you can mm. probably violate the chaos bound, right? So mm. does that also translate that uh, some statement goes off in the scattering amplitudes if you have background fields, like say background electromagnetic field or something, mm. the scattering in presence of background electromagnetic field. E E okay. So to just maybe put it nicely, like if I have a background electric field, like uh, 
I guess probably the, all this reggae bound growth and so on gets modified. So is that also, uh, is that true or, and does that, uh, uh, does that mean like I can have other scattering amplitudes if I have background fields turned on and so on? I, I think, I think what you are saying, if, if like, uh, I think Rohan, I think you are saying that, uh, uh, including chemical potentials and changing the chaos bound is like the, I think I, I, all I am familiar about is like the work from Rohan, right? Rohan Pujari. So if chaos bound changes, then definitely it will change our implication. And that's, that's correct. Like, yeah, but, I but I have not. I was just naively translating that statement as if you have background, uh, say some U1 fields or something, then the scattering amplitude, many of these conclusions De change drastically. Is that or how? No, drastic. Dr yeah. Okay. Um, like my impression about like uh, Rohan's paper was that, uh, I just correct me if I'm wrong, like that you can think of this as like, uh, like the original chaos bound, but your temperature is being modified. Like beta goes to beta plus and beta minus, right? Is that correct? So, right. I mean, it's not like the exponent changes, mm. right? Yeah. I mean, it's just two instead of like having e to the power minus two pi by beta uh, for some or lambda two pi by beta, you get uh, some uh, beta plus or beta minus. Right. I mean, uh, that's as far as I remember. So I, see. Um, I, hmm. I don't recall exactly, but first thing to do, for example, would be to find out like how this uh, chemical correlated thermal correlator with chemical potential maps to a CFT correlator. Okay. So that is the first thing I, I would think would be uh, first thing to like check. Uh, what this maps to for the CFT because the way it goes is that the OTOC yeah, that... can be mapped to a real uh, CFT correlator in real space or with temperature beta is equal to 2 pi, right? And then you look at the ridge limit and the causally scattering sheet. So it's a very roundabout manner. So first one has to, I think, see that how can one have this identification with the CFT correlator in presence of a a finite temperature quantum mechanical system with a chemical potential. That would do. Do you have any idea of how this might go, Akhil? Like, uh, since you have been looking at these sort of things, I suppose. Uh, no, no, not really. I'm actually a bit naive on these things. Okay. Yeah, but I feel that the first thing would be to try to check that, like how it maps to a CFT correlator, like. Uh, because, yeah, well, I would have thought that like uh, it is it is mapping to a safety correlator with a different temperature, but like you know, beta instead of beta is equal to two pi, you have just beta plus equal to two pi or something like that. Like, you know, I I don't know. Like, I, I was thinking something. Yeah, so I I guess you're saying the uh it's the growth the the parametric the growth I mean the type uh, the or uh, the left, left no expand or something is just, just that minimal value is changed. So instead of some two pi to it's changed to some two pi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the bound that, hence, has hence has... these uh, reggae growth and all this, uh, the translation to flat space scattering amplitude behavior doesn't affect, it's not affected I, much. Yeah, I so. would say so, but I wouldn't like put, I mean, I have to think about it also, but like, I mean, because I mean, yeah, because I don't naively see like uh, how how it translates to like yeah this this connection is a bit roundabout so like you know so I I don't know like one has to see yeah okay thank you. I have a question, rather a small confusion to Ankit. Hello. Uh, 
Hello. Hello, uh, Ankit, are you there? Ankit is probably not there. Okay. Uh, so okay. maybe. Yeah, you can ask in Slack. He has a particular channel which I hope he is looking at or something. Okay. Yeah. Shudip, please. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so my question was for Shailesh. Uh, is uh, is he around? Yes, yes, I can hear. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to understand one thing. So in your talk, yes, yes. Uh, you had uh, you had some you had some particular call off conditions for the metric mm -hmm. uh, you yes, showed, yes. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just trying to understand. Uh, so actually, what determines these call off conditions? Is there any principle which determines these call off conditions? So actually, what Donis paper basically says, this PRL paper, so yeah. they have explicitly not uh, uh, given the construction that how have they construct the uh, fall of conditions and the metric also remains preserved along the killing direction. So they just, uh, I mean, consider a general form of the metric like we, uh, I mean, usually do for if you consider the Bondi metric. So a general form of the metric is being considered and then the one tries to find the uh, the, I mean, the uh, unknown metric parameters, right, which are sitting with the dB square or dt, d5, something, the coefficients of the metric parameters, right. And these mm -hmm. metric, uh, the whole metric should also be preserved in, along the killing direction. So that is the one usual uh, tendency I have seen in many papers, uh, including the bounding one also, uh, mm -hmm. by considering a general form of the metric and then one tries to find the uh, I mean, unknown parameters of the metric parameters, parameters, and which also remains preserved and uh, remain preserved along the killing direction. So, and for this particular analysis for the near horizon case, the uh, I mean, the near horizon asymptotic form of the metric, which I uh, mentioned in the slide, and uh, it has been. I mean, there, there are three papers basically by Dones. Uh, one is PRL yeah. one 2016, and then there are mm -hmm. two more mm -hmm. papers: extended BMS symmetry and the black hole memory effect. So all of these initial two papers basically do not explicitly mention that uh, these are the reasons we should consider this type of boundary uh, fall off conditions for the metric. Mm -hmm. They consider, uh, I mean, consider a general form of the metric, and then they said that one can determine the transformations of the metric parameters along the killing direction. Uh, this is necessary point because mm -hmm. this metric uh, mm -hmm. parameters should also be preserved along the killing direction, right? So that is one thing they ensure that if we are taking the general form of the metric and the metric parameters are also preserved along the killing direction, then we are pretty much sure that the metric uh, is asymptotic form of the metric with the given uh, fall of conditions. So that is a thing uh, they have provided, but uh, nothing more explicit uh, details or calculation uh, point of view have been mentioned in uh, papers. So, so that is the one point I could say. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so the uh, okay, so I had another question actually. Yes, yes. Sure. Uh, so, so uh, the other thing which was uh, said that generically you found that that uh, you had two super translation vector fields. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, in your analysis, right? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. So the first question is that why were there two, and then at some point of time later in the talk you said that one of them did not sort of play any role. Ah, uh, okay, okay, so I see. Clarify that. Uh -huh. So first thing, basically, uh, this basically turns out uh, uh, for the near horizon case. Uh, I mean, this uh, the main paper, which is basically by this donate PRL paper. So mm -hmm. there, when they carry out this, uh, uh, I mean, BMS algebra for near horizon case, yeah. because for mm -hmm. the far horizon yeah. case at the null infinity, I mean, the things have been extensively carried out and uh, it has been shown that the super transitions, super rotations can be uh, recovered. And uh, mm -hmm. so that is one point. And for the far reason case, the super transition and memory effect uh, has been shown a connection, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, yes. this is pretty much clear enough. Now for the far reason, basically, so what I mean, Donis BRL paper says that uh, when they try to preserve the metric and they do the uh, transformations of the metric parameters, ultimately, when I mentioned in the slide that this F as a function of V comma XA, so there, there are, I mean, there were there was a parameter kappa, right? Surface gravity. So there could yeah. be two possible scenarios with kappa. One is basically like extreme case, and one one with the non-extreme case, right? So, so and these are the f functions are basically nothing but the transformations which are preserving the metric parameter along the killing direction, right? 
So this F transformations are also a transformation, uh, which are basically also preserving the metric, right? So, mm -hmm. and uh, these BMS transformations are also nothing but the transformations which preserve the uh, metric along the killing direction, right? So ultimately in the solution of the, when we consider the, uh, the uh, variation of the metric parameters along the killing direction, we get two, uh, I mean, functions that T and X along with another function also Y, that is super rotation we call. And these uh, transformations basically uh, will uh, will uh, I mean throughout the calculation basically throughout the analysis mm -hmm. algebra mm -hmm. and charges also they will basically preserve the metric so that is why uh, we are calling them as uh, our super translation those are nothing but angle dependent translations right mm -hmm. so that is one thing and uh, second part of the questions can you repeat one uh, uh, huh so it was something that uh, uh, this yeah so in the second part i was just wondering that that uh, so in this case one of so one one half of the, the yes yeah, one of the bms yes yeah, one of the bms symmetry parameter i was switching off and another was yeah. there and produces mm -hmm. producing some miserable effect right so mm -hmm. the reason is basically if you will look at the paper the difference i mentioned uh, on mm -hmm. the first slide so the whole thing is there uh, if you you will consider the general general analysis that is there in the paper so uh, there will be like uh, super translation uh, super translations T and X, which I mentioned, and also super rotation parameter uh, Y, and uh, there will be sets of equations, and uh, uh, in order to determine the uh, super translation and the super rotations, which will basically generate the same shift, uh, same shift in the geodesic deviation solution, right? That is our goal. We need to connect the BMS symmetries to the geodesic deviation solution, right? So yeah. as a goal, as a goal, when we try to basically solve, when we try to find this super translation uh, and super rotation uh, form, which will basically preserve the mm -hmm. geodesic deviation solution, it turns out yeah. that uh, we cannot have explicit solution because those are complicated uh, uh, differential equations. There are multiple mm -hmm. uh, covariant mm -hmm. derivatives, partial derivatives, and I mean, those are very coupled equations basically, and it is quite difficult to, uh, I mean, find the solutions for a, a super transition or super rotation. So okay. what we did is that uh, if we suppose somehow uh, uh, freeze one of the BMS symmetry parameter, either super mm -hmm. transition or super rotation. So mm -hmm. for simplicity case, uh, when we consider that in one case, if we are switching off uh, super transition parameter for non-extreme case, Papa not zero. So mm -hmm. we find that there is a super rotation which exists and it will induce the same effect in the I mean, so it will induce the same shift in the geodesic deviation solution, which will correspond to the delta lambda AB change in the metric uh, in the displacement solution. And also in another another case, also we, we did the same thing because it is just happening just because of we have a complicated set of equations and we are unable to solve them. Uh, I mean, even analytically we cannot solve. So yeah, that sure. is why okay. uh, we took some uh, assumptions. Can I ask a related question? Yes, yes, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry. So uh, I understand that there were, uh, I mean, the most general set of equations that you got near horizon, you couldn't solve them. Yes. Right. Yes. So you chose yes. a special case and you so showed that that is equivalent to this uh, uh, BMS memories or, or, or uh, related to I mean, the BMS symmetry. Yeah, yeah, that will basically establish uh, <laughs> that this, this change in the uh, I mean, the, the functional form of this super transition or super rotation will induce the same shift in the delta S zeta bar, the component, the displacement uh, uh, change in the vector. So right. that is the but, connection. But, but provided that you initially had more generic solutions, does that mean that the that the symmetries, I mean, the symmetries present or rather the soft modes present close to the close to the black hole horizon is uh, how do I say? It? I mean, they are more compared to the asymptotic soft modes. Uh, I mean, it's a larger uh, set. Uh, of course, that that is a larger. So here we are. We just considered a special case. That I understand. Your point is uh -huh. perfectly valid. So it. I mean, of course, it will be better. And of course, uh, one can also try if one is able to find the full solution of this uh, super transition and super rotation parameter. Right. right. So one can have, uh, I mean, that will be more general analysis. That is perfect. But we were unable to find that is that was my point actually, and uh, could not. No, no, so, yeah, yeah. That, that I understood. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah the problem is the, 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 whether you can find an analytical solution or not but the point is mm-hmm. that even even for a special case where you can find an analytical solution if that mm-hmm. encompasses all the all the bms transformations then that would mean that uh, this this is a larger set right because only a special case of that corresponds to the full bms uh, transformations ha uh-huh. ha i mean uh, you see that is all it is also a larger case i mean these are nothing but this uh, infinite dimensional group right so right. Ulti- ultimately even if we are com- uh, computing this uh, super rotation or super translation so any of the uh, symmetry parameter will uh, ensure that the uh, memory is restored in bms parameter that is true but if one is looking from the observational point of view and follows uh, uh, our i mean in my paper and uh, where we have considered only one special case he might expect that the second extended bms symmetry could also be there right 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 so that can happen uh, from the observational point of view so <laughs> that is the case only i can say i mean <laughs> no thank you yeah it, it was a good it was, question, it yeah. was a wonderful talk thanks yeah thank you thank you so much. Yeah, hi. So I wanted to ask another question. Can I? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Ah, sure. uh, uh, hi. So, so actually, my question was to Pawan. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. okay. So, uh, hi. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So, so, so in your talk, uh, you showed a uh, uh, particular way to, you know. Ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So in your talk, you were talking about this renormalization of the stress tensor operator. Yeah. Uh, so i was just wondering that this renormalization uh, which you did uh, so that was carried out to what loop orders no uh, this is non perturbative uh, this is non okay uh-huh. yeah yeah so uh, so yes. what yes. we are using is uh, finiteness of the greens function when differentiating mm-hmm. with parameters so i we don't I uh, make use of any loops yeah i see uh, so uh, to pavan like i mean uh, i i i couldn't follow your uh, talk like uh, very, very uh, clearly but yeah. uh, since uh, I, yeah i was keeping the time keeping the time also like this thing so if i understood correct that you have a way of computing uh, given a theory you have a way of computing the the full stress tensor in the theory to all loops is that correct Uh, so in terms of other uh, uh, operator scalar or composite operator so i'm just uh, expressing the stress tensor in terms of the scalar operator so if you if you're uh, so if you'll have to calculate them things, yeah 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 so but, those you have to calculate order by order and I mean. and like i'm asking like is that that in terms of what the 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 composite operator that is easier to compute than your uh, for example the stress tensor itself like right right yeah okay and, and do you need to know for example the the the, the full uh, the all loop uh, um, amplitude of your uh, all loop calculation for your composite operator expectation value is that uh, so so for uh... so say, say so the, you you will not mm, so so you you can know the composite operator uh, uh, for phi square but uh, there is a uh, for this total derivative operator you will not know for every loop so you will have to calculate loop by loop i see uh, so so I, i didn't get your question can you ask again yeah so, uh, so i'm just asking like will you be given some data will you be able to compute the stress tensor for a particular cft for example or something yeah that's it but yeah so you will need the correlation functions for uh, so for the scalar operators i'm just trying to figure out like you know where where would you want to use this like what computation in say field theory would this uh, you would your analysis like uh, reduce uh, i mean like you know uh, bring about a reduction in 
say work. work. Usually, in right. given a field theory, like you can compute order by order in perturbation theory, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, so you must be doing something to, like, you know, avoid that or something, right? I mean, yeah. So, like, I'm just trying to ask, like, what is that? Like, I mean, how how am I? So, doing that? so at least this uh, tensor operators, uh, they must be more complicated than the. Uh, scalar operators calculating the Feynman diagrams for them. Mm -hmm. So see. at least you're expressing the tensor operators in terms of the scalar operators. I see, I see. And like, and then, and, and, like, suppose that these, in terms of these smaller composite operators, I don't know the full, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the full non, uh, full, like, some, like, all loop uh, result. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would yeah. your formula be, still work? Because as you said, it's a non-perturbative result. So therefore, like, yeah. you know, I uh, somehow like I would have expected that uh, you need on the right hand side also the unknown quantities to all loop orders. Otherwise, this formula would be not valid. Uh, or uh, uh, no, I don't see why it would not okay, be valid because I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the unknown quantities on the right hand side, you would compute say one loop or two loop up to one yeah. loop or two loop and you would get your stress tensor up to this thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, have you guys tried to compute like uh, this thing in some known uh, theory? For example, like there are these finite temperature field theories which uh, people study like, you know, some yeah, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, have you guys done that? Like, no, no, but uh, there are results in already in, in finite temperature field theories using similar techniques. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. I see, I see. Thanks. If uh, there are no more questions, we can perhaps stop the recording. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, can I ask one question? Uh, yes, yes. Ah, uh, okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it is not related to any part of the talks, actually, and it is a bit naive question from the general relativity point of view. So, I mean, it is a, open, <laughs> a platform for the discussion, so I uh, thought I was just thinking of to do something. So, the question is basically like uh, generally uh, when we do whether we consider the spherically symmetric square shield black hole or uh, where we uh, or we consider the axis symmetric uh, cut black hole. So, we have basically we can figure out the killing vectors as a, I mean the uh, and corresponding conserved quantities, the energy and uh, momentum. And we try to construct the uh, I mean orbit equation, right? So the goal uh, is basically to find the effective potential and uh, we can predict the orbit of the, uh, I mean, null geodesics or time-like geodesics accordingly. And we can also get the orbit equation. So that is pretty much fine as long as we have uh, two, uh, I mean, killing direction and uh, as, uh, and uh, associated conserved quantities one can compute and uh, one can define the impact parameter and uh, do the analysis by defining the effective potential. That is pretty much fine and well-known uh, procedure. But now uh, I just had a little doubt if we consider uh, the, I mean, the talk I gave on displacement memory. So we had suppose this general form of the metric or a special case, even one can consider or one can consider the boundary metric. Uh, so in that case, uh, I mean, we have a non-spherical part of the metric, which is not even curl-like, right? So uh, we, I mean, the metric is written in uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, we are theta phi, we are theta phi or we are Z, Z bar coordinate system, this uh, spherical, I mean, complex coordinate in the spherical part, right? So we have only one uh, killing direction that is uh, del del V, right? So one uh, conserved quantity, I mean, corresponding to this asymptotic, I mean, corresponding to this killing vector, we can associate, of course, but there is no other uh, conserved quantity, uh, I mean, or killing vector we can see in the a metric 
is, for example, if you consider the Ponty metric, right? So how can we basically find the orbits of uh, these null geodesics or time uh, like geodesics in those cases we, where we have only one killing direction? So is it possible in, in these cases, uh, the simple simpler case will be the uh, Ponty metric. If anyone has any idea, like something, a remarks for this. Because this will be interesting for, from this because uh, these orbits, computation of orbits might contain this super translation parameter and for the near horizon case, uh, it can have some miserable effect. So that is why I was thinking of this problem. <laughs> so this sort of, uh, I could not figure out uh, uh, from many web sources. So maybe uh, open, it is a sort of an open problem and a small problem, but it is, I think, a bit interested, interesting problem to carry out also. So if anyone has a solution or anything. Is it good in curve metric? Is it also uh, so in curve? The, uh, I mean, in the curve metric, we have one this, uh, I mean, T phi simultaneous symmetry and another constant we have Carter constant, right? So, I mean, we can basically do the analysis in curve metric in a way that we can find a D phi by DR type of equation. That is our, and also we can define the effective potential, right? So we, we have uh, well-known results and uh, I mean, uh, the extensively carried out uh, things for curved black hole. So that is pretty much fine. There is no issue. But for Bondi type of metric, I don't see many, I mean, I don't find any uh, literature which can deal with the, uh, uh, I mean, orbit plots for null geodesics or time black geodesics. Uh, I can see only one, I mean, redirection uh, killing vector, but uh, I mean, how one can proceed for this? I mean, unless there is some hidden symmetry, hidden symmetry maybe yes, that, that yes, yes, that, that is exactly that is your point. That, that was also my hunch, but unless or until we can figure out, we cannot directly tackle, right? So that is why I just tried to pose this question. If one has any alternate approach, also maybe that might be helpful. 